2 Timothy chapter number 4. We'll begin reading in verse number 16. The Bible says, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, the Apostle Paul's writing to Timothy, a young pastor, who the Apostle Paul mentored and who studied under the Apostle Paul. And as he's right there, a lot of, you know, preaching and teaching out of chapter number four. We don't have time to go over all of it. But we find right before these verses that he warns them about Alexander the coppersmith who did the Apostle Paul wrong. You know, he t talks about Demas who forsook him and then those that he sent away. I mean, it says here that, you know, uh, Cretans went to Galatia, Titus under Dalmatia, obviously Timothy in with him as well. He's on his way to come back and see him, but he's not there at the time. He says that Tychius he sent to Ephesus. He says, only Luke is with me. And as he finishes up that thought, it gets into verse number 16. And he says, at my first answer, no man stood with me. He's saying, I've got Luke here. That's more than I had when we started. He said, at the beginning, nobody stood with me. He said, at the beginning, everybody thought that the Apostle Paul was a fraud. Thought that he was a trickster, a swindler. Why was that? Because he had persecuted the church for years. Right? He had put Christians to the death. Right? He signed and carried out the paperwork and gave it to the people that carried out judgment. And he said, those people die because they proclaim the name of Jesus. Right? He says, at the beginning, nobody trusted that I was really changed. And he said, so I started off with just me and God, is what he's saying. He says, at the beginning, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray that, I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. He said, at the beginning, the only one that I had was God. He says, at the end, the only one that I need is God. He's telling Timothy, he's saying, God had a purpose for everybody else except for Demas. Demas forsook him because he loved this present world right, more than he loved God. But the rest of them, it says that the Apostle Paul, he sent away. They had something else to do for God. He sent them along their way. He said, you go down there and do what God told you to do. In fact, I believe the Apostle Paul, being the Apostle Paul, would have said, I don't want you here because if you're here and God wants you down there, you're going to be a hindrance to what God wants to do here. He says, the best place you can be is down there. I don't want you here no more. He says, I love you. Right? You're my friend. You're my brother in Christ. But get over there. That then goes on to say that the Lord stood with him, strengthened him, that by the Apostle Paul, the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I, the Apostle Paul, was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. They're saying all the way back in the beginning, not the beginning of time, but the beginning of the Apostle Paul's ministry, he says, no man would stand with me. He said, but I found out I didn't need anybody to stand with me. Had God, that was enough. Right? But then he says, he wasn't preserved for his own sake. The Apostle Paul wasn't anything more than you and me, just flesh and blood. Right? He was given spiritual gifts to heal people. Right? But that's because he was an apostle, so that he could go out with power. People would believe the things which he preached. Right? Well, he goes out and he says, wasn't because anything I did. He said that by me, preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear. He's saying the only reason that God did anything with me is because God decided to use me 
to get the gospel out to all the Gentiles. That, you go study it. That didn't always look like the countries on that map right back there. But every country that's ever existed has had the opportunity to receive the gospel. Some of them rejected it and they're still paying, paying the price to it or for it to this day. But at some point throughout history, all the Gentiles had an opportunity. Where'd that start with? It started with Jesus. Then through the instrument of the Apostle Paul, he got to throw a whole lot of minor and major Asia. Then where'd it go from there? Perpetuity of the gospel from one believer to the next. It just kept spreading. But the Apostle Paul was the instrument that God used to start that domino effect. He didn't say that some Gentiles might hear. No, he said all. Why? Because it's God's will that all should come to repentance, that none should perish. So he says that by me preaching might be fully known all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. See verse number 17 that's all past tense. He said delivered me out of the mouth of the lion. What's verse number 18? And the Lord shall deliver me. That's future tense. He's saying, he did it before, and he will do it again. Not for my sake, but for his name's sake. He says, I'm doing my best to follow after the Lord. Timothy knew that. But he's saying, I'm doing my best to follow after the Lord, be in his perfect will. He says, I know he'll deliver me further, because he's not done with me yet. He says, and shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever forever and ever. Amen. So the Apostle Paul says, Timothy, I'm nothing special. He says, everybody else, Lord sent them off to do something. He says, but, I know God's not done with me. He says, Luke's here. But even Luke, at some point, would have to leave. He says, I know you're on your way. Bring the cloak that I left. Right, bring the parchments. What's that? That's part of your New Testament. And he's saying, when you do come, God's still not done with me. I need them things. He says, and whatever God's got for me next, he stood with me in the beginning, standing with me right now, he'll stand with me through to the end. And he said, Brother Jordan, that's pretty simple. Yeah. Here's where Jordan gets involved and things take the corkscrew. Okay? As I was studying, not many passages throughout the Bible could pertain to it. Right? Jesus said it this way. If any man love father, mother, son, or daughter more than me, it's not worthy of him. Now, anybody here today willing to stand up and say that the Apostle Paul didn't love Jesus more than anything else? I don't believe we can say that. I believe the Apostle Paul loved God first in his life, supremely. Now Joshua said this way, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What Joshua was saying is, I don't care what y'all do. Us, we know what the right thing to do is, we're going to serve God first. I believe that the Apostle Paul purposed that in his heart. That anybody else think that they could find accusation they don't know. I mean, we know the Apostle Paul wasn't perfect. He said that he was the chiefest of sinners. There are days that he did what he wouldn't do, and then there were days that he did do, or didn't do the things that he would do. What are you saying? He was still in the same flesh that we were. But overall, I believe that the Apostle Paul said, as for me, I'm going to serve God regardless of what anybody else thinks. That has a whole lot to do with what we heard about on Thursday night on that revival living. Right? See, here's the thing. We already heard all week long about what it takes to have revival. Right? Well, what's it take to keep revival? You've got to have the same mindset that the Apostle Paul had. Right? Not just for a day. God has to burn it into your heart. We all know that we can say, well, of course, Christ should be first in our life. Right? We should seek Him first. Just like 
Brother Sidney on Friday and I said that guy kept coming up pray that I make Jesus Jesus already Lord it's just whether or not you let him be Lord in your life right well the apostle Paul says at the beginning no man stood with me he's saying all I had was God he says you know what I've still got today God he says it doesn't matter how many people are with me he says I purpose that having God's more important than anything else says I wish Demas would have stuck with us but he decided to go off into the world because he loved it more than he loved God he said it didn't deter me none Alexander the coppersmith hated him for some reason right did much evil to him he said it didn't deter me any I didn't care what Alexander thought more than anybody else then he starts going down these are people that he loves people that have labored with him he says, God sent them over here and over there and over here. He says, but losing them didn't make me lose any of my devotion done to God. So what's it take to keep revival? Keep, you know, it takes a certain mentality. But see, mentality can change. Right? You've got to ask God to burn it into your heart. Right? To make it a part of you. And what is it? Uh, it's something very simple to just throw out there, Brother Ron. Very hard to live. But that mentality, right? I don't care what anybody else thinks. Now, when I say anybody else, I mean anybody else. We're going to get into specifics here. But I don't care what you think about me. Don't care what you think about my spirituality. Don't care what you think about what I'm doing for God. All I care about is what God thinks. It's very easy to say. A whole lot harder to live. You say, Brother Jordan, aren't we supposed to be kind of... I didn't say be nasty to people. You can love people and still ignore what they say. If you don't believe me, ask all the women in here that are married to husbands. They've ignored them a whole lot. Right? They're just saying, yeah, we'll just let them talk. Right? And then at the end, okay, honey, whatever you say, and then they go back to doing whatever they were doing in the first place. Right? Even, and don't think that we can stand up and make the argument today that parents don't love their children. Okay? But there are times that kids are talking in the back seat and you just got to tune them out. Right? They're in la-la land talking about whatever. It doesn't make sense. Just every now and then, yep, okay, sounds good. I'd still love them to death, but whatever they're doing back there is going to be distracting. Right? Going to take your attention off the road. Does it mean that you don't care about what they're saying? No. Love them to death. Right? But can't let that love interfere with what we're doing right now. Right? Same is true for your spirituality. Right? Everybody's entitled to their own opinion, or as I like to say it, everybody's entitled to be wrong. You don't have to agree with me. Right? But just because we don't agree doesn't mean that I have to conform to what you think. The Apostle Paul said at the beginning, no man stood with me. He says, I know what it's like for everybody to criticize what it is that I'm doing. That you think you've got about everywhere that the Apostle Paul went, he went through an inquisition. Aren't you the one that killed all them? That was Saul of Tarsus. Right? I'm Paul of the road to Damascus. God changed me. Right, and every guy said, "Well, how do we know that you're real?" Right, well, had some scales on my eyes, went down, into Damascus, went into a brother's house, scales fell off of the eyes. Then we went back to Jerusalem. Right, sent for Peter. Everybody there bore witness that I had the same Holy Ghost that they had. Right, I'm I'm just in. Right, everywhere he went, that guy's a phony. Don't talk to him. He's going to try and deceive you. He's trying to get evidence in order to give to people so that they can put you to death. He's standing up and preaching Jesus, but if you go walk up to him and profess that you believe Jesus, he's going to write your name down on a secret list, go give it to the high priest, and they're going to kill you. That everywhere that he went in the beginning, everybody's staring clear of him. He walked down the street, everybody get on the other side of the street. The Jews hate him because he's now professing to be 
something different, which means everything that they believe is a lie. All the Christians don't trust him because of what he used to be. Right? And the world don't want anything to do with him because here's this crazy preacher preaching out in the middle of the street or preaching you know, on a street corner down in you know, the city hall, wherever it is that he was. He's preaching up a storm about how wicked we are and how much we need a sinner. Everybody hated him. Be it, we don't find that that affected his spirituality. Did he love the Jews? Of course he loved the Jews. He wrote that his one desire is, is that his brethren, the Hebrews, would just have one more, ch the grace of God would fall on them one more time to where they would be able to hear, to understand, to perceive that Jesus is what they needed. Did he love the church? Absolutely. Half of the New Testament was written by him to the local church. But did he love lost souls? Absolutely. You think he wouldn't have traveled literally across all the known world at that time to preach to lost people if he didn't have a heart, didn't have a burden for lost people getting saved? He loved them. But his love didn't impact his devotion unto God. You want to know what keeps revival around? When you go back to work tomorrow, that everybody, how was your weekend? Everybody else starts talking about what they did. Oh, it was Easter, so we had everybody over all weekend and had a great feast. Right? Then everybody left and we had to clean up all the mess. Now you say, well, actually, you know, I had some food too. Okay, but everybody else saying, oh, we know what you did. You went to church. Instead of being intimidating, yeah, I did go to church. It was fantastic. Right? In fact, before that, we went to church all week. Y'all wouldn't let me talk about that last week. So I'm going to talk about it now. Right? When Wednesday rolls around in your family, hey, can you come over and help with this tonight? Well, what time? Six o'clock. Nope, can't do it. Why? Because I got church at seven. But I love them, Brother Jordan. They need my help. Don't need your help on Thursday, too. But let's get even more specific. I think everybody around here agrees that, you know, being at the house of God is pretty important. But, I mean, I know who I'm teaching. I know everybody agrees with that much, at least. You're here for Sunday school. But let's say when... You wake up 15 minutes late, do you cut out your Bible devotion or do you cut out part of your morning routine? Would you skip breakfast or would you skip reading your Bible? When you've had a stressed out day and you've got to lay your head down on your pillow, you just phase out and watch TV until you pass out or do you still pray to God? Do you still take the time to say, Lord, show me what I did throughout the day that you're not happy with. Show me what... I did that you are happy with. Confess it and make it right. You're going to sleep a whole lot better. Right, if you're driving around with somebody in a car you normally don't ride with, do you change the music you listen to? Would you take out the CD of the Lancasters that they've been giving out all week? Or right, would you just let it play? Carry on a conversation with somebody. What do you say? So many stinking people claim to be Christians care more about what other people think than they do what God thinks. Right? I understand feeling like, you know, you're outnumbered. Right? We are outnumbered. We're a remnant. You know what a remnant means? Very small piece. Right? That's what the Bible calls us. We small. Right? He big. With him, all things are possible. If everything was based in the size of the church and how many of us there were, right, it wouldn't be faith. But, here the Apostle Paul said, right, the Lord stood by him, strengthened him, then it says, delivered him out of the mouth of the lion, shall deliver him from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. Let's look at all three of them words. Right, strengthened him. You know what that means? He overcame 
all the intimidation, all the oppression, all the persecution that we don't have to go through. But he's saying, the Lord strengthened me to get through all of that. But then, he delivered me. What's that mean? Well, because I let him strengthen me, because I went on and continued doing all the things that I knew God wanted me to do, right? He delivered me out of situations that should have destroyed me. You know what delivered means? It would have killed him otherwise. You can't be delivered from something that wouldn't hurt you. That then, he says, and will preserve me. What's that mean? He's going to keep me just as I am so that I can keep doing what I'm going to be, what I have been doing until I've done all that he's called me to do. What's that mean? God gave him everything that he needed to live how God wanted him to live. And didn't let the world impact any of those things. Delivered and preserved. He strengthened me, delivered me, and preserved me. What's that mean? The world couldn't touch what he had. So don't tell me, right, that the work handbook doesn't facilitate. If they can talk about everything under the blue moon, I can talk about things that I like. Right? Don't tell me that the coach, right, just won't understand and you can't have a conversation that, hey, don't have a problem with the kids showing up from this time to this time, but we're leaving at this time so that they can get ready to go to church. Does it, but Brother Jordan, that won't ever work. Hogwash, it does work. How do you know? I found out. First hand experience. Right? But, but what if this, what if that? Well, what's more important, baseball or Jesus? Right? I promise you this. Right? If you do what's right in the eyes of the Lord, God will open the If they really want to, God will open a door for them to be able to do both at the same time. Right? You do understand that this world is sports nuts. Right? And, well, that's the best team. Well, one, nowadays we don't even know what the best team is because everybody's a winner. Right? Lady at work the other day was talking about how they let, at some elementary school team or something, real young kids, but they let the girls play with the boys and then everybody got upset when one kid caught a ball, turned, and then went to go shoot, well, he elbowed a girl in the face. That's what I said, Brother Ron. I'm like, I didn't play football with girls. Right? By saying girls can't play basketball? Absolutely not. Said he went to college on a basketball scholarship. Right? Sid would kick my butt in basketball any day of the week. But if Sidney came down into the paint and I was there, right? She tried to guard me, and I thought, hey, didn't mean to hit her in the face with an elbow. Right? Because my elbow was around other people's elbows. Right? Sydney, being so much, it might have been in her face. Didn't mean to. Right? But why get angry at the kid? Because you put her out there. Anyway. Just makes sense. But trust me, there's a whole lot of sports out there. Just because it's not the one that everybody's the most excited about, right? Or the team that has the most fans, or quote unquote has the most talent, right? Well, I'll say this too. Okay? Coming from experience, I understood the game of football very well, Brother Tommy, right? Just couldn't do it, right? I had all this. I could, I could coach it, right? Not so good at playing it. Right? But if your kid has to be on the team with all the talent, maybe your kid's not going to be playing that much. Because all the other talented kids are on that team. Just saying. Right? Is it all about them having fun, or is it about you being validated with all the stuff that they're doing? Okay? Because it's worth all the investment because they bring home the trophies. No, it should be worth the investment because it's something that they want to do. Right? Not to force them to do it. I was a pretty good baseball player, Brother Ron. Not as good as Dad. I played in the select league. I don't know why I'm talking to you all of a sudden this morning, but here we are. Yeah, I know. 
Played in the select league. That started off in Notho. Dad was a coach. He tells me I had a swing that looked just like King Griffey Jr.'s. There's just one problem. I'm not King Griffey Jr. Right? But if I made contact, I'd knock it out of the park. Pretty good catcher. Right? Played select league. Then I found out that I was going to have to be playing about 100 games every summer. And I'll never forget it. We had a tournament in April. Who plays baseball in April in the sixth grade? Right? And we played just outside of Pittsburgh. Coldest game I have ever. It was colder than any football game I played in. Right? It was like a makeshift blizzard up there, and, and we're out there on a baseball field playing. What are you saying? Every pitch, it felt like that knuckle right there in my hand was breaking because my hand was so cold in the catcher's mitt. Right? I lost my passion for it because I thought I wanted to play 100 games a summer till I realized. A hundred of them games aren't played in summer, right? Some played in spring, right? Whole co- I went with our ace pitcher from the Not Hole team. We came as as tandem. That his name was Jody. I hated him because he used to throw knuckleballs because his dad wouldn't let him throw curveballs or sliders, and my dad wouldn't let him throw curveballs and sliders, so he didn't throw out his shoulder at a young age. And he'd get this big grin on his face from the mound, and I'm shaking, "Don't you do it!" And then knuckleballs come in, and it's doing this the whole way. Me and Jody go way back. We said we went over together. Jody thought thought the same thing. He said this isn't fun anymore. Right? They're taking this too serious. He's like, we're not in the majors. We're in the sixth grade. Right? It was also that year that I found out about this thing called public speaking and debate. I right? found out I was pretty good at that. That was more fun. Right? But they took it too serious. What are you saying? It robbed my joy of it. What are we saying? But let me circle back. I was pretty good at baseball. Right? But I used to like baseball. Then when I stopped liking baseball because of all the stuff I had to do to quote unquote play baseball now, right? Wasn't fun no more. Took my love of the sport of white. What are you saying? There's a whole lot of things that go on in this world to try and convince you that, you know, devoting everything unto Jesus, not worth it. Not fun. People don't care about what you want to talk about. Right? People don't want to spend time and listen to you talk about what you want to talk, so maybe it's just not important no more. They try and get you to bottle everything up. Under pressure, they're trying to keep you quiet. Your flesh is trying to keep you quiet. Well, point number one. Out of verse number he strengthened me. God will give you the strength to overcome if you're willing. That if you purpose, God first. That you by faith believe that God will give you the strength to overcome any of it? Guess what? He will. Why? Because he's no respecter of persons. If he did it for the Apostle Paul, he'll do it for you. But, well, what was the second? He said, well, he strengthened me. Then he delivered me. What's that mean? Paul's faith put him in some precarious situations. Because the Apostle Paul didn't back down, right? Because he had a backbone like a saw log, right? As some of them southern preachers say. Because he wasn't shut up because he knew what he was talking about was true, right? He ended up in some nefarious hands. Go back and study all them people in the book of Acts that he stood in front of, like King Agrippa. Right? They were men that were known for being harsh. They were men that were known for holding up the letter of the law, not the spirit of the law. Right? The only reason that they didn't pass judgment was because Paul had already appealed to Caesar. Well, we know that Agrippa said, you know, he might go free if he were the judge. What's that mean? He still wasn't convinced. I think Agrippa liked the Apostle Paul. He said, almost that persuades me to be a Christian. Almost wasn't enough for him to get into heaven, but I believe that he liked the person of the Apostle Paul. I, I believe that maybe he would have set him free. But even he didn't know. You know why he didn't know? Because God said, you're not the one that's going to be making the decision. God delivered him out of every single situation. 
Look at all the times that the Jews laid in wait. We're going to kill them on the road somewhere. Right? Concocted stories about them. Trying to get somebody else to kill them for them. Through it all. What happened? God delivered them. You ever think that sometimes the safest place for the Apostle Paul was in a jail cell to keep them away from all the murderers outside of the jail cell? You telling me God didn't know that? You tell me that God didn't know the Apostle Paul in the jail cell could have just as big of a revival as anybody else? What are you saying? Him and Silas got to praying and shouting. What happened? God heard it and like Brother Sidney Priest on Friday night, he cleared his throat. There's an earthquake. Right? Opened up the jail. What are you saying? God had everything under control. Paul knew that God had given him the strength to get him through whatever he needed and that God was going to do the rest. So what's that mean? He didn't let the opinions of others impact him. Now here's where does it will preserve? You know what you need in order to preserve something? You need something to start with. You can't preserve an empty can. Right? You can't make peach preserves without the peach. Right? Or blackberry without the blackberry. And we're not talking about the old cell phone with the wheel on the side of the phone. We're not talking about fruit. Well, you say, God can only preserve what's still left around. You only preserve what is excess. Right? Those things that you preserve, it's because you've already eaten what you need and you had leftovers, so you're trying to keep it. You want to know why God was able to preserve the Apostle Paul? Because the Apostle Paul was more than just in, he's all in. He had given everything unto God and said, Lord, I don't know what to do with this. It's in your hands. So God preserved him. When you preserve something, right, nowadays we just throw it in the fridge. Right? But back in the day, when they, do it, when they had them old root cellars, right, or even further back than that, right, when it was just woods, they knew that if they could get some salt into something, they knew if they could dig down deep enough to where it would be cold all the time, and they put it there, that it would last longer. To preserve something means that you can keep it for longer without losing any of it. It's not preserving milk if you leave it out on the blacktop and you're shocked when it's spoiled at the end of the day. That's not preserving. That's wasting. You knew what was going to happen. Right? You invested, you took money, or you went out and milked the cow for some unknown reason because you haven't heard of UDF. Okay? And you took the milk knowing that it needs to be cold and you put it out there in the parking lot knowing that it's not going to be cold. But Brother Jordan is supposed to get down pretty low tonight. Yeah, but sun coming out tomorrow. Right? As Shirley Temple said. What are you saying? You knew what was going to happen. To preserve something is that you can take it, put it somewhere, and then when you go to get it, it's the exact same. Otherwise, you didn't preserve it. That means that no harm came to it while it was over there preserved. But see, Apostle Paul, he's saying, I've given God everything. By faith, I believe that he'll give me back what I need when I need it. And it's still going to be just as good. You know what happens to ham? Right? Anybody? I don't know if y'all like us, we eat ham on Easter because we're tired of eating turkey at every family event, right? Okay, in fact, I think nowadays we just eat ham in almost all of them. Yeah. Ham good, bacon good, pig tasty. Okay. But we take that ham, we can throw it in the fridge, guess what? It's going to be just as good tomorrow. Well, Bert Jordan, it's not going to be hot. It can be warmed up. But if you don't want to wait on the oven to heat it up, there's this thing called microwave. Okay, does it very quick. What do you say? The fridge preserved it. Still the same tomorrow as it was yesterday. All them things that you invest into God, guess what he does with them? He preserves them. Right? All the time that you invested, right? When you need to be reminded of one of them things that, he stu that you studied, God just pops the top on one of them and says, here, there's that thing that I preserved for you. Still just as good today as it was back then. But how do you get the 
preserves from God. You've got to invest today in order to have something preserved tomorrow. They say, the Lord preserved me because I didn't know what I needed for tomorrow. I don't even know what I need for the rest of the day. They say, by faith, I invested and studied those things that God told me to study. And then when I needed it to be revealed, God revealed it. Right? I invested in other people and then God saw that, took that investment, and then when I was in need, He preserved me. Right? Not because I gave to enough, but because He loved me. But He also said, you reap what you sow. You're good to people, God's going to be good to you. You're good to those in need. When you're in need, God's going to be good to you. Maybe through another person. Maybe through the church. But God's going to preserve you. Why? Because you've labored, you've invested, you've given your best to God. He preserves it. If you take spoiled milk and then put it in the fridge, it's still going to be spoiled milk when you take it out. You've got to preserve it while it's good. Can't get anything good out of something that started with bad. If you start with your best, guess what you're getting out of the fridge? Cream. Right? The creme de la creme. You put the best in, you get the best out. You give your best effort today studying for the things of God, God will be able to remind you of more tomorrow. You devote more time today, then He'll be able to remind you of more tomorrow. You spend more time getting in tune with them today, you'll be able to discern more tomorrow. You spend more time praying over somebody today, right? You may find that delivery is just around the corner tomorrow. The Apostle Paul knew all about investing into other people, knew about investing into God. How do you know it? Because he said, God preserved me. You know who didn't preserve him? All the people that threw him in jail. All the people that wanted to kill him. Right? Even his own friends couldn't do anything for him when he was on the other side of the bars. He said, don't worry about it. God's got this. Go and read his epistles. He's writing half of them from behind bars. And you know what he's saying? God's got me just where I need to be. He's saying, I'm preserved. I may not be able to get out and preach today, but people are coming and preaching to me while I'm in here. He's saying, it's helping my soul. God's preserving me. And now let's really get down to where it's rubbing me through. And then we'll be done. Remember when I told you Jesus said, if any man love father, mother, son, or daughter, more than me, he's not worthy of me. Just came out of great revival. Good revival, man. Great preaching. Right, but if we're honest, nothing new. We've heard that before. God just reminded us of it. Wasn't foreign to us. Right? It wasn't like, what's this that they're talking about? No, we knew what they was talking about. Right? So let's say we do purpose to live what we heard this week. What if your significant other stopped living that way? Would you still? Because the Apostle Paul said, no man stood by me. Nevertheless, the Lord was with me. He's the one that gave me all my strength. He's the one that delivered me. He's the one that preserved me. He says, I don't care who comes and goes. Right? What if your kids start critiquing the things that have changed because of revival? Would you go back to the way that it used to be? Right? What if those things that God purposed in your heart this week, how long are they going to stay around when everybody starts nitpicking on why you don't do things the way that you used to do things? How long is a new routine going to stick right when your favorite TV show comes back on? It may not be off on season right now. Right, but it rolls back around. Right to that Netflix. I'm pretty good at binge watching. I can get them done in about two or three days. Right? But I found out the other day, but I haven't watched Netflix in a long time. You want to know how I know? Because I went back in and my list, all of them said new episodes. And I'm thinking, I've been away a while. Well, I used to. I used to watch it almost every day. It's just not important anymore. Right? I can't tell you the last time that the PlayStation 4 went on. 
was probably to watch a movie because I don't have a DVD player attached to the TV. Right, or Blu-ray player, whatever it was. What are you saying? Those things that used to be important, those things have faded. The thing that's remained strong, the thing that will strengthen, deliver, and preserve. Right, but we're talking more than just entertainment. We're talking more... I'm talking about deep down, right, in your soul, that inner conversation you have with yourself throughout the day. When everybody else is ridiculing you, right, not saying that you go and hand in your Bible and say, Brother Doug, I'm done. No, I'm saying when everybody ridicules you, can they get you to the point where you just be quiet? Because if you're quiet, guess what? They won. Where you just conform? Right? Where you just stop breaking the mold so much, just do things the way that we do it. Well, okay, I can do that for eight hours a day. That's a third of your life. Right? You can't be right with God two-thirds of your life and then live the way that they want you to live another third of your life. Right? And that's assuming that you're right with God while you're sleeping. I don't know what happens while I'm sleeping. I'm asleep. Right? Do other people affect... We, we've talked about your walk. Right? Your witness. Do other people affect your worship? If somebody else comes in in a bad mood, does that affect how much you worship when you come into church? That's really rare for me. Is what happened on Friday. Anybody else? There was something funky going on in here on Friday. Throughout youth choir singing. It just seemed like the kids. Something wasn't going right. Then throughout the, the rest of the singing, every time it felt like, you know, something was building up, then all of a sudden it just died off again. Right. Maybe I'm going crazy, Aunt Lynn. Right. But I do know when God's moving and when God ain't moving. Right. Kept happening, kept happening. I started getting angry. I'm like, who in the world is stopping this from happening? Right. What I want to do is go around and start looking at people and say, is it you? And then when I found them, throw them out that door over there. Right. That's just the way either get in or get out. Then what happened? And God pricked my heart, and I went over there for a little bit. He said, why, is it, why does anybody else impact how you worship? You do what you can, which is worship, and then let them deal with me the way that they're going to deal with them. So what did you do? I went over there, and I confessed, and I said, Lord, I'm sorry, I wanted to throw people out the door. Okay? But then also, just purpose, I don't care how everybody else is doing it. God been too good for me not to shout the roofs out. Right? God's been too good to me. Even if God never did anything else for me ever again, guess what? I can still come in and shout and worship because of how good He has been. But right? don't matter what's going on, you know, collectively. Right? That's from you and God. Do I want things to get real big? Yeah. But I understand that some people, you know, every now and then, wolf and sheep clothing might come in. Somebody might have grieved the Holy Ghost, quenched the Holy Ghost. It's rare around here. Right, but also understand we had a lot of visitors on Friday night. You saying it was one of them, Brother Jordan? I don't know. I'm not God. I just know that for a little bit, I let something that I had no control over impact the way that I was worshiping. What to do? I had to come over here and get right with God. Right, but that's something I didn't know. How much more often do we let the things that we do know affect how we worship, how we walk, how we witness? I can stand up here and honestly say as long as I'm preaching out of this okay, and I'm preaching what God told me to preach I don't care about opinions from other people okay, now if I was wrong on something I'd care about that right? the pastor came and said hey when you talk about something okay what you did this guess what that hadn't happened But I don't care about what people say or think about this. This is above opinion. It's infallible. It's the Word of God. Don't care what people say about my Savior. How do you go talk about Him if you don't know Him, one? Two, He left enough witness for me to prove that you're wrong on what you think. 
But if I don't care about all them things, why do I care about what they think about me for living the way that he said to live? He said, but Brother Jordan, they're very important to me. Yeah. Are they more important to you than God? Because if you want revival to stay around, guess what? It doesn't matter who says it, what they say, how long they say it, revival living, right, carries on when we just purpose, no man stood by me at the beginning. Nevertheless, God stood with me. Guess who stood with me the entire time? God. Guess who's still going to stand with me? God. Guess who's strengthened, preserved, and delivered? God. Guess who else has done anything? Only he's done those things. So cling to the one that can help you and run from those, right? Or put up some walls in your life, some barriers where those people don't have an impact over how you live, right? Because we should live for the one that gave us that new life, that life more abundant. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.